On this episode of This Week in Linux, the Pinebook Pro is now available for pre-orders. A critical security bug was reported for VLC, but that was quickly debunked, so we'll take a look at the details for that. In app news, we got a couple new apps to check out, a command line cheat sheet app called cheat.sh, and a live video mixer tool called Nagaru. We've got a lot of distro news this week from Fedora, SUSE, Magia, and we also got some from Arco Linux, Sparky, and Slackle. Later in the show, we'll take a look at the new version of Coreboot and some Linux gaming news with RetroArch and a new Humble Bundle. This actual Humble Bundle gave me some interesting perspective regarding various bundles that I want to talk about as well. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. You can get all this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud-agnostic tutorials to help you stay up-to-date with the latest open-source software, languages, and frameworks. You can get started on DigitalOcean for one month for free with a $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. That's do.co slash tux. And again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with that $50 credit by going to do.co slash tux. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Before we get started with today's episode, I just wanted to take a moment to let you know about Destination Linux. Destination Linux is a podcast where four Linux enthusiasts discuss the latest news, interview interesting people in the Linux community, and have a good time discussing a wide range of Linux topics. Oh, and did I mention that I'm one of those four people? So you should definitely check it out. You can go to destinationlinux.org to check out the, or, you know, you subscribe to the RSS feed, or you can go to destinationlinux.org slash YouTube to go check out the YouTube channel. We have a video version of the podcast. It is four people t- discussing our passion for Linux, and I think it's definitely worth checking out. Especially the next episode, one of our hosts was unavailable to uh, participate in that episode, so we asked one of our uh, patrons and community members to join us, so you should definitely check that one out. It's coming out in the next couple days or so, so you don't want to miss it. You can go to destinationlinux.org, again, to subscribe to the RSS feed, or destinationlinux.org slash YouTube to uh, go to the YouTube channel. Definitely go check it out. It is def- it is worth watching. I think it's one of the best podcasts on Linux, you know, outside of this one, or you know, in addition to this one, it's it's one of the best podcasts for Linux related podcasts available. So definitely need to check it out. A first in the show this week is something I'm looking forward to and we're still looking forward to it really because the pre orders are now available, but that's awesome because we've been waiting for a while to see when the Pinebook Pro is coming out, and they have now announced that you can pre order the Pinebook Pro. So that means that we're getting really close and I can't wait. So if you haven't heard of it, the Pinebook Pro is a really nice laptop that is also pretty cheap because it's only $200, but it has a lot of good hardware in it, and it's an ARM-based laptop, so that's why they can make it you know, reasonably priced like that. But recently, Lucas from Pine64 did a demo video of showing 1080p and 4K playback using an external monitor connected to a USB Type-C port on the laptop. And there was no screen tearing or, or stuttering that you could see, which means, which is fantastic. You know, that's a really good thing for the hardware being able to play 4K like that. Uh, so it's really cool, and I think, and I can't wait to try it out. But let's talk about the specs for a bit. So the specs of the Pinebook. Pro include the Rockchip RK3399 SoC with a Mali 10860 MP4 GPU. It also has 4 gigs of RAM for our LP DDR4 RAM, 1080p IPS panel, magnesium alloy shell body, which is really cool because the previous Pinebook was a plastic body and this one's a full metal one, which is awesome. Uh, the bootable micro SD card slot is available, which is previously available on the Pinebook as well, which is really nice because I utilize that all the time. Uh, the 64 gigs of eMMC RAM, uh, storage, which is also upgradable. And if you are a forum member, you can get a 128 gigs uh, just by using a coupon code. So if you go to pre-order it, make sure that you use the coupon code if you are a forum member. Now, if you, uh, there is a stipulation there, like a, a restriction, or not a restriction, but an asterisk. You only get that upgrade if you decided to become a forum member before July 1st. So if you wanted to do it now, you wouldn't be able to get that upgrade. Uh, so you'd have to do it previously when we, we discussed the Pinebook on a previous episode. So hopefully you saw that and were able to create an account for it. 
This laptop comes with a lot of USB options. It has a USB 2.0, USB 3.0, and USB Type-C. And on that Type-C, it has support for data, power, and video output, which is really cool. So you can get HD digital video via the USB-C. You can, there's also a lithium polymer battery, which is a 10,000 milliamp battery. It comes with uh, stereo speakers, it comes with Bluetooth 5.0, Wi-Fi 802.11ac, headphone jack, of course, because, you know, for some reason people are removing those things from devices. Thankfully, Pine64 is not doing that. Uh, they're also, it's also got a built-in microphone, a front-facing front camera, and it's got two different options for keyboard choices. And based on, you know, some people might not want the camera on at all times, the microphone on at all times, or the Bluetooth Wi-Fi. And thankfully, the Pine team have created uh, a functionality so you can have a pri privacy switches for the camera, microphones, and their microphone, and the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So you can actually turn off those when you're not using them, so they're not going to automatically just start uh, there's also really cool that they have a really nice large trackpad where, you know, on some laptops you have these really ridiculously small trackpads. And I have used it on the Pine Book, original Pinebook, and the trackpad is a very nice size. So and it looks like it's going to be the similar size on the new Pinebook Pro. So I am very excited for this. I can't wait to get mine. Uh, so I'm still, we're still having to wait because we're currently in pre-orders, but I think that uh, if you are interested in getting a secondary laptop or, you know, getting a laptop for someone who would be beneficial, who would be able to use a Chromebook for like the day-to-day -day usage, I think this is a fantastic alternative because you get full Linux rather than a Chrome OS, whatever thing. Uh, you could use the Chromium OS if you want to, but you can also have uh, a real Linux system on it, which is great. Or you can do both actually. With that bootable micro SD card slot, you could actually have one, on, like for example, Chromium OS on an SD card, and then use that when you need to, and then take it out and have a full Linux system. Uh, or if, like for example, if you get you get one of these for a kid, you could do that with the Chromium OS on the SD card, and then let them use it for their school or whatever, because for some reason schools are using that now. And then you could take out the SD card and then get a full Linux laptop. So that's really cool. Those are that's you know that's a different options you could choose. Getting the Pinebook instead of a Chromebook, maybe that might be a great option because it's actually probably cheaper than most Chromebooks anyway, right now. So. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'll have a link to the show notes, uh, in the show notes to the, what the order page for the pre-order of the Pinebook Pro. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm definitely excited. Up next in the show this week, there's some interesting news regarding VLC, and that is a security bug vulnerability that's been spread around the, the, the tech world this week regarding the really critical 9.8 vulnerability inside of VLC that wasn't really a thing and wasn't inside of VLC at all and also wasn't even that big a deal because it's already fixed. The, compu the uh, computer emergency response team from Germany called CERT-BUND uh, pushed out an advisory warning uh, for network administrators and, administrators and other users that a high impact vulnerability in VLC was found. And they even so, sh say that there was traced back to a ticket that was open on the public bug tracker more than four weeks ago. Now, four weeks ago, was the, when they they discovered it and, and notified VLC about it, apparently. However, the bug itself was solved 16 months ago in a completely separate library because it wasn't actually VLC's issue that ha that was it was found in. They found it was a part of a, li a third-party library, but that was already fixed and already implemented in VLC. Now, the, the interesting thing is that there was some... Uh, not only was this misinf misinformation was shared pretty far... It was also create. They also created a CVE. The people who uh, issue CVEs, like the Mitre Group or Mitre Corp or Mitter Corp, I'm not really sure how to say that, uh, but they issued a a CVE for uh, this particular vulnerability without even contacting VLC. So VLC couldn't stop them and say, "Hey, you don't have to issue a CVE. We we fixed it 16 months ago. It's not a big deal." But unfortunately, they didn't ask VLC about it and issued the CVE and made this big fuss about it. And they even put it as a 9.8 critical vulnerability, even though it wasn't that at all. Because not only is it not that, it was uh, it was actually an issue that requires you to download a particular file, manually execute that file, like a video file, and then it would be at an issue if you had an old version of a specific library. So VLC responds on Twitter in a really long thread uh, picking apart this whole issue. But they say uh, about the security issue on VLC. 
VLC is not vulnerable. The TLDR is the issue is in a third party library called libebml, which was fixed more than 16 months ago. VLC since version 3.0.3 .3, has the correct version shipped and the MITRE Corp did not even check their claim before issuing a CVE. So the interesting thing is it seems like the tests were only done on one particular version of Linux. It was done on Ubuntu 18.04 and it wasn't even done on Windows or Mac or anything. It was just done on that particular version of Ubuntu. Now Ubuntu's problem was still there. There actually was a vulnerability because Ubuntu 18.04 shipped libebml, uh, the previous version. So the fix in libebml was actually released in 1.3.6. I think they're on 1.3.9 now or something like that. But it was fixed in 1.3.6. However, Ubuntu 18.04 shipped 1.3.5 that did have the issue, which was like a buffer read overflow type thing. So it was it definitely still was there, but it was only there for that particular version of Ubuntu. But uh, 18.04 has it been has fixed it now thanks to this big issue. However, if they would have found this issue, contacted VLC, and then find out, hey, this is fixed in 1.3.6, that must mean Ubuntu 18.04 is still shipping 1.3.5, and it needs to be like security patched. And now that Ubuntu has been notified of it, they fixed it with a security patch. So that's all that really needed to be done, but instead there was this huge um, you know, press a attack on like jumping on the possibility of VLC being vulnerable and uh, people were talking about how you should you should remove VLC immediately. And there was even one article that said, you should remove VLC from your computer immediately. And the update was, maybe not. So the people who reported the bug did not contact VLC security team prior to making a de public declaration of the vulnerability. The MITRE group uh, issued a CVE without contacting VLC about the issue. And the National Vulnerability Database gave it a rating prior to talking to VLC about it. Uh, but now since they've realized that it's not anywhere near as bad, it was still a problem in general. It was still an issue that existed. So having it in the database could be valid. Uh, but they went from 9.8 to 5.5 fairly quickly once they realized that it wasn't that big of an issue and that Windows was not affected, Mac was unaffected, most Linux distributions are not affected, but older versions of uh, like LTS type distributions might have an older version that's not patched, and that's quite possible to be still in affected. So a very small number of uh, issues, or well not, a small number of distros probably are affected, but because it's Ubuntu LTS, there is probably a significant amount of people who might be affected by it, however, to fix it rather than going to just make this huge uh, tech hysteria or hyperbole about VLC being vulnerable or whatever, they could have just talk to VLC and say, hey, I found this issue. Could you help me figure out what the problem is? And they were like, oh, because you're using Ubuntu 18.04, they, they need, you need to get this version of 1.3.6 or convince Ubuntu to do a patch and therefore, you know, whatever. That, that could have been done rather than just you know, big hoopla about this vulnerability. But, you know, the tech the tech news world was super happy to make uh, articles really quickly without doing any research, and that's why they had a lot of copy and pasting on the details. And that's why almost every single one of them mentioned the 60% patch is on the way or, what, or like the patch is 60% complete, even though there was no patch in the first place needed. So, whatever. If you'd like to learn more about this particular issue, I'll have a link in the show notes below. Up next in the show is an interesting cheat sheet for the command line, and that is cheat.sh. It is a interface that is not only available in your terminal, it's also available in your browser, so you can go to cheat.sh to check it out if you like, or you can use curl space cheat.sh and then a parameter to uh, use the cheat sheet to get documentation and all kinds of stuff. So it covers 56 programming languages, uh, several database systems, and more than 1,000 of the most important Linux-related commands. Uh, it has it gives you documentation, like help pages and stuff like that, based on all these different things using the cheat.sh. You can use website or the curl approach. Uh, it provides access to a community-driven cheat sheet repository as well, and they say that it's on par with the Stack Overflow repository, which is a pretty strong statement. Uh, they also say it's available everywhere, no installation needed, which is true because you're using a, but you can use the curl uh, space 
uh, cheat.sh website to get the information, or you could also install the uh, or download the client, the command line client cheat.sh, but I think it's actually cht.sh in order to uh, use it locally if you would like to in the sense of not having to use curl every time. That's up to you. It should be fine either way. Uh, but they say because they say it's ultra fast, they return answers as a rule within 100 milliseconds. So that's quite fast. And they say that you can use the cheat.sh script if you'd like, but it's not mandatory because you could just use curl. Uh, but they also say that you know, it can be used directly from code editors without opening a browser and not switching your, like switching your mental context of when you're editing something versus when you're getting documentation and stuff like that. You can just do it directly inside of the, the editor, which is really interesting because at first when I saw this and I saw that, that, that uh, feature as part of the script, or part of the service, I was thinking, well, okay, probably like Emacs and Vim, right? That's things that are inside of the terminal. But it's not necessarily just those two. You could act, it is those two, yes, but you can also get it to be supported in Sublime Text, IntelliJ, and Virtual Studio or Visual Studio Code. Uh, so it's got a lot of support for various different uh, apps. So that's pretty cool. Uh, if you'd like to check it out, I have a link to it in the show notes, but you can go to cheat.sh to get command line cheat sheets. Up next in the show is the 1.9.0 release of the uh, video live video mixer Nagaru. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. I'm not exactly 100%, but it's a Japanese word to uh, mean to throw or to cast, so like uh, broadcasting kind of thing. Uh, so Nagaru is, is a live video mixer. Uh, it's it's this particular release uh, is not that really that interesting in comparison to other releases because it's mostly just like fixing for theme theme fixes even though there are significant changes for the themes it's not really why I wanted to cover it because I wanted to cover it because just I haven't talked about this this application before and it's pretty interesting so it's a modern free software video mixer it's also got a multi-camera instant replay system with slow motion and that particular feature is called uh, uh, Fototabi Let's go with that, Fatatabi. And uh, this is interesting because they're, they're different applications, and but they are made to work together, and they share a lot of the same source code, so they actually are distributed together, but they are two different things. One is the cast system, which is Nagaru, and uh, Fatatabi is the um, replay system, and that is Japanese for again. So I think that's kind of the way they, they decided to name this stuff is interesting. Um, and, it, and it takes in inputs from, like well, for, uh, Nagaru takes in inputs from one or more video cards and mixes them together using a layout and theme written inside of Lua or lit, written with Lua, and it outputs an H2 H.264 stream over TCP. So it uses it supports video cards like Decklink PCI cards, Intensity Shuttle cards, uh, Ultra Studio SDI cards, and some others. So it's interesting because it's a very similar thing in the sense of like OBS sort of, but it's more of a hardcore type of OBS. It's, uh, it requires you to set up stuff through Lua. Uh, and I just thought it was pretty interesting in general because I had re- just recently heard that this existed. And the um, the amount of like how much you can mix and switch between the different cameras and having a replay system with slow motion and all that stuff, that's pretty, pretty cool. So uh, if you're interested in checking out something like that, I'll have a link to it in the show notes for Nagaru and Fatatabi, uh 1.9.0. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Up next in the show is the distro news section, and up first is Fedora Core OS. This is the first preview release of Fedora Core OS, and this is a new edition built specifically for running containerized workflows. It's actually the successor to both Fedora Atomic Host and Core OS's Container Linux. It's like a combination of both of those. So Fedora Core OS combines the provisioning tools and automatic update model and the philosophy of the Container Linux system with the packaging technology, the OCI support, and the SE Linux security of the Fedora Atomic Host. So it's like a nice uh, combination hybrid of the two. So uh, the containers are you know deployed across multiple nodes 
which is for redundancy, which means that the OS can update itself automatically and then reboot without interrupting workloads. So that's how that's one of the reasons why the Fedora Core system, why they decided to integrate because they could make that work, and that's a really cool feature. There's no guarantee that the preview release will be successfully up, uh, updated for the later preview releases. So this is just to say that this technically you should check if you would like to check it out. It, it you can use it, but don't put it in production because it's not really ready yet. And they say that it's going to be in the preview period for about six months or so, and then they're going to release uh, the stable version. And they also said that the CoreOS container Linux will still be maintained until about six months after the Fedora CoreOS is declared stable. So basically a year from now is when the CoreOS or container Linux will be discontinued or unmaintained. So this is really interesting. Not only is it a cool idea as far as having, uh, you know, containerized entire systems containerized, but also because it is a specifically built system for containers, it means it doesn't have to run all the other stuff that a a Linux distribution or operating system would need. So it can have the bare minimum of a system that needs that to run containers and then whatever you put in the container there, we can, you know, can go from be whatever you want. So that's really cool. But also I like the fact that it's called Fedora Core OS because, well, if you're not aware, uh, a long time ago, Fedora decided to change their name to Fedora and then the number, but it used to be called Fedora Core. So by them combining together and creating Fedora Core OS, it kind of brings back the name, which I like because I was a big fan of Fedora Core. I'm still a fan of Fedora in general, but I do like the fact that they're using the core name again. Even though it wasn't really the intent or purpose of doing so, I still like it. So Fedora Core OS, if you'd like to learn more, I'll have a link in the show notes. So Sousa has named a new CEO, and her name is Melissa D. Donato. Melissa is the former CEO of SAP, or SAP. And Melissa's response to the statement of, you know, regarding the announcement, she made a statement saying, there is no greater honor than to lead SUSE into its next chapter of accelerated growth and corporate development. SUSE is at the cusp of historic shift as open source software is now a critical part of any thriving enterprise's core business strategy. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Melissa as far as how SUSE goes and also regarding the open SUSE um, potential independence that they were talking about. We talked about it in a previous episode about how OpenSUSE is thinking about a new branding thing and having some more independence from SUSE. They're not trying to like leave SUSE. There would still be a heavy in, uh, connection. They would still have uh, like the core integration would still be there, but they would be they wouldn't be limited in terms of like having to deal with like trademark issues or potential trademark issues with the terms with the name SUSE in their name. So it's interesting to see what happens there. Uh, whether they have like it's because there's a new CEO, maybe they have like a difference of opinions about which what needs to be de- independent or whatever. Uh, I think it'll be just interesting to see what happens. Uh, and also, this is going to be like a really competitive market because of like IBM uh, purchasing Red Hat and all that stuff. So there's going to be a lot of pressure in the space. Uh, but it's worth noting that former CEO Brockman delivered great results with eight years of expansion and revenue growth. So he's basically handing over a very healthy company to prepare for the upcoming cloud wars. Uh, I, I don't think they're calling it that, but that'd be kind of fun if they did. Uh, it also says that uh, there's also in this announcement, they say under D. Donato's leadership, Sousa will continue to f- focus on growth and expansion and what that means is that she's expected to advance SUSE's core business and emerging technologies both organically and through add-on acquisitions, which is pretty interesting to see what kind of companies that SUSE would want to acquire to improve their uh, their place in the market. So I'm looking forward to see what that happens there, and I wish her the best of luck in her uh, you know approach to whatever happens with SUSE because I like SUSE. I like OpenSUSE. There's a lot of great technology that they create, and I look forward to see what they do in the future. Up next in the show is just a follow-up to a previous topic we discussed in a previous episode regarding Magia and also regarding AMD Ryzen 3000 support. So there's been some issues with AMD Ryzen 3000 uh, CPUs coming out and not supporting uh, certain types of uh, Linux distributions, mostly the more up-to-date versions, having more up-to-date versions of a systemd in the kernel. It's not really con- it's more of a systemd related issue, but uh, older LTS things like Ubuntu LTS were you know perfectly fine with running these di- these different types of hardware, but newer systems that had newer versions of System D had weird boot issues and the fact that they couldn't boot at all. So I wanted to bring attention to that. There a lot of there's a there's a lot of distros that still can't do it, uh, including Ubuntu as far as I know. 
but uh, Papa Wes has done it, and now Magia Linux uh, has seven like Magia seven point one issued a new update just for the ability to fix these uh, booting issues with System D and the AMD Ryzen three thousand CPUs. So that's pretty cool if you're interested in having if you have one of those pieces of hardware, you might want to check out either Papa Wes or Magia Linux seven point one to utilize that hardware and hopefully the motherboard manufacturers will issue a firmware updater to fix the, the issue because basically AMD has fixed it but we're still waiting on motherboards to actually deploy the fix so we're still waiting but there are a couple options now so that's great this episode of This Week in Linux is also made possible by the Tux Digital patrons. If you'd like to become a patron you can go to tuxdigital.com slash patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n or tuxdigital.com slash sponsus, S-P-O-N-S-U-S, to become a patron. Now, if you'd like to do uh, Patreon, you can do, join for just a dollar a month, and on sponsus is $3 a month. The reason the minimum is 3 on sponsus is because of the way the transaction fees are different. Uh, basically, processing companies typically have a structure of a certain percentage plus a certain amount, like 30 cents or whatever, but on a dollar... 3% 3, 3 plus 30 cents becomes 33%. So it's just not practical to do it that way. However, Patreon has an has a... Well, actually, Patreon does it the same way now. But the older method that Patreon used to have was is very different. And I'm grandfathered into that account with Tux Digital. So I can use that. Rather, that's why it's a dollar there. Uh, but normally, new Patreon, uh, Patreon accounts can't do that. But either way... Uh, if either if you're doing a dollar or three dollars, whatever you might be doing is uh, very much appreciated because it makes it possible for me to make this show and also to make this channel in general and spend time making this content. Because if you're not aware, making the show takes a ton of time. I have I'm basically uh, researching things throughout the week in order to do the show, and then once I do the show, I have to record it, and that takes a few hours. Then editing takes a few hours, and then all the publishing and metadata stuff. It does take quite a bit. So any amount whatsoever is awesome, really. And if you if you think that one dollar is not enough, like one dollar is actually pretty awesome because the more people who do one dollar, it adds up pretty quickly. And it might not seem like enough to you, but it definitely can add up. So if you would like to do so, become a patron. I would pre I would very much appreciate it. You can go to tuxdigital.com slash sponsus, S-P-O-N-S-U-S, or tuxdigital.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, to become a patron of Tux Digital and This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is the latest release of 19.0.11 of Arco Linux, and there's a lot of interesting things that are being done in this particular release. In fact, they've uh, made it easier to to use the LTS kernel in in uh, as an option for Arco. They've also uh, added a new desktop option, which is LXQt in the Arco Linux B ISOs. They've also uh, modif modified the boot theme, like the boot screen theme, as well as done some um, improvements to like the boot lines of like, options you can do. So they've added options that you can quickly boot with modified boot lines, like Nuvo, Radeon, i915 or 915, and also uh, one of the most common used parameters is no mode set. So it makes it a lot easier to utilize that boot line. So that's pretty cool. They've also made it possible to quickly toggle, uh, use a keyboard shortcut to toggle uh, the Conky setups on XFCE and Openbox versions of the system, and as well as added some new Conky scripts to check out. They also have some uh, bug, fi a lot of bug fixes and some performance improvements and all kinds of stuff like that. And if you've never heard of Arco Linux, it's a great way to uh, learn Arch. It's kind of like a like it's designed specifically for helping you learn Arch. So you start with an easier install. Once you get used to that, you go into like the more uh, specific options, and you can then even build it to like your own uh, personal like uh, super minimal basis setup, and then you can build from there. And then it kind of like gradually gets you uh, you know used to building the uh, Arch an Arch system, so you can then go to the Arch way. So instead of going straight to Arch way and trying to learn like the core basics of how you build the system, you can use Arco Linux to gradually get there. So that's a pretty cool thing, and uh, I think that Arco Linux is really great. I think they need some consolidation and some, you know, improvements to their website because it is a little confusing, and uh, there's a lot of uh, confusing t uh, freight, like words of how they how they describe things and how they lay out things, and also because they have multiple different versions of the website. They have like Arc ArcoLinux.com and ArcoLinux.info and some other stuff. So uh, Arco Linux, while having 
uh, it, while our websites are not great, Arch Linux itself is great and also a great way to learn Arch. So if you'd like to check it out, I have a link to the latest release and also the main site where you can get the downloads for Arch Linux 19.07.11. Up next in the show, some more distro news, and that is Sparky Linux 5.8 has been released. So Sparky Linux is based on Debian. It's actually, they have like, this is a stable release of 5.8, and it's based on Debian 10 stable or Debian Buster. And now it's interesting because the way that Sparky Linux works is that they have their first version of their stable release uh, based on Buster is, number, is version number 5.8. So it might be kind of weird that the first one they make is 5.8, but they actually do development on the particular series uh, while it's in the testing mode before they actually release the stable version. So the first stable version is 5.8, but they've been working on it for quite a while. So the next version of Sparky Linux 6 will come out, but that will be based on Debian testing of the next version, which is Bullseye. So that is an interesting structure. That might be why it might be confusing for some people to see that their first stable release of the Buster branch is number 5.8. So 6.0 will come out, but that will be a testing version rather than, or a, you know, it's, you know, still in beta version, sort of. Not exactly beta, but, you know, kind of like that. So the stable version will be, continue to be the 5 series until the next version of Debian 11 will come out in a couple years. So uh, they've actually updated the system from uh, their repos of the latest repos of July uh, 14, 2019 for the Buster repos. They've, so they got the latest kernel of uh, 4.19.37 for uh, i686 and AMD64, so 32-bit and 64-bit. And they have the 4.19.57 for the ARM uh, architecture. They also have the Calamari's installer, and they have updated that to 3.2.11. They have disabled the apt daily service. They've installed as a default the Sparky Tube, uh, which is definitely interesting. You should check that out. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, they've also uh, removed some old third-party repositories as well as added a obconf-qt uh, configuration for the LXQt edition. And they've in uh, installed a... The, the package in network manager dash tray or in nm tray to replace the network dash manager dash gnome inside of the LXQ edition, which by the way, the reason I'm talking about the LXQ edition is like the main DE that they ship is LXQ, but they also ship other DEs. So like the the flagship is LXQ, but they also have many other versions as well. And they've also done a lot of uh, uh, small fixes and performance improvements and that kind of thing. So if you'd like to check out Sparky Linux, it's definitely worth checking out. I have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show, and the last topic for the distro section of the show, is Slackle 7.2 has been released. So Slackle is based on a combination of things. It's based on Salix, which is based on Slackware. So they also say that it's, it's fully compatible with both Slackware and Salix. But the difference between the two is that Slackle has a current version of Slackware, whereas Salix doesn't necessarily. So it's actually kind of interesting because Slackware is not updated that much. Uh, so technically, Slackware hasn't released a new version since 14.2 and that was a couple years ago, and Salix does have 14.2, but there have been some updates and patches made since then, which Salix ISOs don't seem to contain, so you might be able to upgrade them once you have it installed, but they don't have it built into the ISOs because the ISOs haven't been updated since the that version of Slackware was released. And it, But it looks like Slackle does provide those updates. So you, if you use Slackle, you kind of get uh, Salix, but a little bit more up-to-date. So, and also Slackle comes with a different interface. They use OpenBox, whereas Salix uses XFCE. So if you wanted to use XFCE and then upgrade everything, you might want to check out Salix. But if you uh, like the uh, option of using OpenBox, then Slackle is definitely worth a shot. Uh, Slackle claims to offer three editions though, but their KDE Plasma and their Fluxbox versions are very out of date. So I would say basically they just open, they just use an OpenBox uh, edition. Uh, but it in, this latest release includes the uh, Linux kernel 4.19.57, the latest updates from Slackware's current tree, which is the up-to-date packages that I'm talking about as far as like since 14.2. Uh, and it also has, uh, this new version has 64-bit uh, builds and 32-bit builds and has added support for uh, booting on UEFI systems for the 64-bit image. 
They've also set up their own uh, USB writer tool, Instant USB, that allows you to install uh, Slackle and Salix 32-bit and Salix 64-bit images to a USB stick. There's also other options as well, like multi-boot USB and some others, but they've built their own. Uh, so if you want to check that out, that's available. Uh, they've also done some other things like uh, creating a, you know, using a custom GUI installer like other distributions have. Uh, they, they're, they're working on making it easier to install Slackware because Slackware is not really the simplest structure to do. Uh, so that might be worth checking out if you're interested in trying Slackware, but you want to have like an easier access. Maybe Slackle or Salix would be a good option for that. But anyway, I'll have a link to the show note in the show notes for Slackle 7.2 if you'd like to learn more and maybe check out the distribution Slackle 7.2 open box. Up next in the show is the 4.10 release of Core Boot. Now, most of the changes of this release were to the main boards and to the chipset side, so there was lots of activity concentrated on the x86 architecture. However, uh, compared to previous release activity, they actually increased development in the V-Boot and also in non-x86 architectures, whereas the previous releases was more like a focused, like a single topic focus. But this release actually accumulates a lot of stuff. So it's actually cool because there's actually a lot of new developers on this particular project where they have 198 developers or or authors on their commits of this particular release with 2,538 commits to the master branch. And of these is 85 authors are new and made their first commit to the core boot project, which is really cool because that means uh, 43% of the people who worked on this particular release are brand new to the project, which is really awesome. Because having, you know, it's always great to see new developers join a project to improve it and that kind of thing. So that's pretty cool. Uh, between the releases, the tree actually grew about 11,000 lines and added uh, two system on a chip boards as well as 28 main boards support. So that's really cool. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Core Boot, I'll have a link to this release in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the Linux gaming news, and up first is something really cool with RetroArch. RetroArch is heading to Steam. So if you're not aware, RetroArch is the official reference front end of the popular LibRetro API. So while there's nothing specifically about uh, LibRetro or RetroArch that is for emulators, it is a very common purpose that is used for. Uh, but they said they want to grow our base, as the, and as of this month, we have been putting a heavy focus into making sure that RetroArch can run originally bought content on game disks. I assume that you would burn the disk and be able to use the content through RetroArch, which would be really awesome. Uh, you could repurpose like you know old content and be able to play those games. That's awesome. There are further announcements to follow in this coming weeks, and we are open to dialogue with game developers, publishers that have the rights to the original IP who want to bring their games over to Steam through the use of RetroArch, which would be really awesome if a game developer who didn't who made it for like old consoles and stuff wanted to make their games be available on Steam. They could use RetroArch to do that, and that's an awesome concept. I hope that you know developers and publishers do that because there's a lot of potential for that because there's a lot of games I want to play that you know are only available on consoles and that would be awesome to see. They say that the release of this the details of this particular release that they're doing on Steam is that RetroArch will be free. So if a developer would like to use that as a part of their being able to be on Steam, they can do so for free, which is awesome. Uh, but there is some issues in that the first version of RetroArch on Steam will be for Windows only. Uh, but they will be making Linux and Mac OS versions in the future. They say we're a bit wary of the support burden that will come with a much wider audience, so we wanted to do the Windows version first to make sure we can handle the demand. But they say at the beginning there, there will not be any difference between the version you can get on Steam and the one available on our website. As such, no Steamworks and SDK uh, functionality will be present at launch or any additional Steam features. However... After the initial launch, we will begin exploring options on how we can start leveraging Steam's functionality as a platform. And they say the approximate release date of the RetroArch on Steam will be July 30th. So this is pretty cool. I think this has a ton of potential, and I can't wait to see what happens with this because Linux gaming is just getting bigger and bigger, and having this being making it possible for uh, developers and publishers to bring games that were not really ever meant to be on Steam, the possibility of being on Steam, that is awesome. And finally this week, we're going to talk about a couple bundles from the Humble Bundle team. And first of all, we're going to talk about the Gaming Win, which is the Hooked on Multiplayer Bundle. 
And this is pretty interesting because I want to talk about the uh, potential of getting these bundles for other than just getting games that support Linux. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because there's only one game in this bundle that is natively supporting Linux. It's called Baroni, so you might want to check it out. But there's also some other games that are not technically supported by Linux, but they do have support in some fashion for Proton. So, for example, there are four games that are uh, listed and rated on uh, the ProtonDB as gold ratings. That's the Totally Accurate Battle Simulator, the Super Animal Royale. Both, both of those are like PUBG-related things that are like, you know, silly uh, competitors to PUBG, I guess. Uh, they also have Killing Floor 2 and Death Squared. Now, the interesting thing is that some of these games... Uh, well, these oh, hold on. those are the gold games. There's also some other games that are like platinum-ish, like for example, in Versus Deluxe, uh, it doesn't have enough review reviews yet, so it doesn't really have a rating. But so far, the current rating is platinum-ish, so that might be good. And there's also other things that like Think of the Children that is rated as silver, but it's more kind of platinum, because it doesn't really have enough ratings. But some of the ratings are kind of contradictory. Uh, and then there's also Death Garden, which is completely borked, so you can ignore that one completely. But uh, what I wanted to talk about is the fact that the Proton DB uh, potential for testing is an interesting aspect of these uh, humble these humble bundles. So you can buy a bunch of games and then test them out to see and see if they work on Proton, and then help you know grow the data on Proton DB. So I, I you know that's an idea of. As long as, in my opinion, as long as the, the bundle has enough games that are you know playable on Linux, I think that it doesn't have to be native necessarily. So, for example, there's only one native game in this bundle, but there's a lot of games you can play, you can play through Proton. So, the totally accurate Battle Simulator, the Super, Super Animal Royale, Killing Floor 2, and Death Squared are gold ratings right now. However, uh, the Killing Floor 2 is actually leaning towards Platinum. Uh, based on the amount of reviews, and also in Versus seems to be platinum, but because it doesn't have enough reviews, we don't really know because I think there's only one for that one. However, Think of the Children is an interesting t uh, situation because it has three ratings: one is platinum, one is silver, and one is borked. So it is basically uh, being uh, rated as silver because the borked one will like uh, cancel out the platinum one. But the interesting thing is that the person who, it, it seems, I don't know for sure because there's no accounts or whatever associated, but based on the hardware, the person who cre who set up the Borked, who uh, submitted the Borked one was also the same person who submitted the Platinum rating. So it's like they, after, mo after more work was done on, the, on Proton and they tested it some more, they found out that it now works. Uh, so it's kind of interesting because I, I don't know if it's possible to, uh, change your rating or you know remove a previous rating or whatever but based on having the same apparently the same person uh, you know tested again it does seem like this particular game the think of the children uh, which is funny because their slogan was ready set parent uh, it's like a multiplayer parenting game I don't know uh, but that's on a plan platinum now so I think it's interesting to have like you know, get these humble bundles because you could be testing these games for the, pro the Proton. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm going to be getting it. Uh, because while technically Baroni is the only native game, many of these games, actually most of these games, are somewhat playable in some way on Linux through Proton, which is really cool. So anyway, if you'd like to check it out, I have a link to it in the show notes, as well as another bundle. And that bundle is the Humble Book Bundle for Data Analysis and Machine Learning by O'Reilly, which has books like Advanced Analytics with Spark, Practical Statistics for Data Scientists, and a bunch of others. Uh, but so if you'd like to check out these Humble Bundles, I'll have a link to them in the show notes. And I do want to make it clear that the links in the show notes are affiliate links. So if you do decide to purchase in either one of these bundles, uh, if you use that link, I would very much appreciate it because it actually helps the Tux Digital channel and the This Week in Linux podcast without any cost to you because a small commission of the uh, bundle purchase will go to the channel and to this podcast. So if you do decide to get the, either one of these bundles, please use that link below because it will definitely help out the channel and I would very much appreciate that. So yeah, uh, affiliate links in the show notes below. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. 
If you'd like to support the Tux Little channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many more. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere EU for shipping inside of Europe. And if you're not aware, the, this, this shirt is a, something I designed. It's the Linux is Everywhere shirt that has Tux blended into the background to convey the message that uh, whether you know Linux is there or not, it more than likely is because basically Linux is everywhere. So it's like a celebra celebration of the pro pro proliferation of Linux. That's that celebration proliferation. There we go. I got it that time. Anyway, if you also want, if you wanted to contribute in other ways, we actually have ways that whether you can do so without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, and many more by going to tuxedo.com slash affiliates. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux as I'm a co-host of that show. So thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.